Everyone's still awake? All right, we're going to Crown. I want to just emphasize again, this is an advanced topic. It's not something that you should start out with. And there's things that, that are going to be easier to do in hair and things harder. And this is one of the harder things. I think I've made 100 bucks last year on this book, so uh, that's my disclosure. Um, how do you sell something that you can't see, right? The crown is area in the back. And um, you got to sort of present it from all sides because there's a benefit actually from all angles. From the front view, there's actually a benefit. So when you have graphs that extend upwards over the back side, over that vertex transition zone, they're actually aiding in the visual density from the front view. The, the side view is another area that we don't think about. When you see someone thinning in the crown, you can see it from the lateral view because they have a flattening effect on the back side. And then the baldness on the back is clearly obvious. That's the main reason we do it. But we need to think about and have the patient understand that it's actually a benefit from all angles. Who's a candidate? And this is really important to be selective in your candidacy. You've heard this in terms of safety and aesthetic benefit. So I personally think that you, uh, 35 plus is a good age to start with. When you're very young, you're always worried that that crown is going to get exposed and you're going to have not enough grafts to cover it. I have done patients younger than 35. I think it's a good uh, landmark age to sort of make a judgment. But clearly, you see a 35-year-old that has this huge open crown, limited donor hair. You're not going to just say, hey, I heard Sam tell me 35 years of age. Perfect. Let's check him off and do it. Um, you got to use judgment, and that's going to be the other factors as well, such as um, that cons considering if the front is still very open and you want to really focus on the aesthetic frame to the face, you don't want to just go back and do the crown because it A, could look unnatural, and B, could waste donor hair and not provide the aesthetic benefit since you haven't done the front yet. The other thing, too, is that you want to make sure that the hairs potentially could be stabilized. If there are a lot of miniaturized hair, hairs, you'll shock them all, and then you'll have uh, greater loss, and you'll look like you've taken one step forward and one step back. And then uh, understanding this whole idea of supply and demand, if your donor hair is weak and you have this wide open crown, you may not ever want to approach it. And I think it's important before you touch a patient, even for the frontal area, if they've never had a transplant, that you underscore, maybe I can't do your crown. Would you accept that? and you couldn't shave your head because there's a, a linear scar back there or whatever reason, can you accept the fact I can't do your, your crown? And I think even if you don't do a crown, you have to set up expectations before your first transplant for that. The other thing is you need to understand the crown is a progressive area, just like everything else, but even more so. So you have to plan for that. We're going to talk a little about strategies and planning. And if the patient is not ready for it, that's a problem. We're going to talk about what the billboard effect means and why sometimes it takes two transplants to get the crown done adequately. So we'll talk about that in just a minute here. There's different types of patterns. This is a Zering study that looked at what exists out there. So this is not anything but just sort of academic understanding that there's different patterns that exist in nature, um, with diffusion being more present in women and the sort of clockwise S version more common in men. The other thing you need to do is look at the patterns that exist. There's all different shapes and sizes. The one thing I want you to want to emphasize is this last one called the coronet. Sometimes this little bald zone is hidden underneath some donor hair and you miss it. And then you either harvest from that area that's unsafe or you miss to, to, to transplant that area and they won't have a complete result. And it may look off. So the billboard effect, what is this? I use this terminology during a consultation. Anytime we're at work in the crown, I love using this terminology. I actually don't know who came up with it, but it's a great way to communicate with someone. The billboard effect, if you think about it, if you have a frontal area of a scalp and you're transplanting it and it's flat like this, you're not seeing baldness straight on. You're seeing all these army soldiers lined up, those are your graphs, in, in rows. So you don't see direct onto the, the bald scalp. When you're working in the crown, which is a vertical plane, you're looking directly at the baldness, which makes things much harder to create visual density for. The other problem with this is that they're all in a, a whirl. So think about all these soldiers lining up in a circle. They're not each blocking the, the view of the scalp like in the frontal area where they're all lined up and staggered and interlocked. So this is a visually harder to achieve density area, and a patient must know that when you're doing, doing that. Planning the donor area. Where are you going to harvest? You know, what's safe? If you look at this, you can sort of see that there's this little coronet 
area. And if you start harvesting that area, A, he could recede into it, and B, he's already bald in the area. So you want to avoid that area when you're planting the donor area. And you need to take enough grafts to get the, the, the crown done. That's a wide, big crown. You need to be able to cover it. So uh, for me, a long harvest is usually what I do, sometimes up to 30 some centimeters if I can get it. Be careful again, I just emphasize harvesting the temple area if you haven't done that. The initial plan is the baldness, okay? I want to cover that. But is that sufficient in terms of the, the degree of filling? Well, maybe I need to get a little beyond that, right? Because if I go a little bit beyond that, that's going to be an area that A, he's going to lose hair into, and B, when you wet the area, you, sometimes you'll see that it actually, once you wet the hair, you'll say, oh my god, this is a wider area of baldness than I had actually imagined. And the other thing, too, is when you're working on an older patient, you could become more conservative because he probably is going to lose less hair. What is older? It's a relative term, relative size, all those things. But when you're working on a younger patient, you're always worried about a, a rapid progression outside of your, your transplanted zone. So you may have to actually be more aggressive, which may be a little bit counterintuitive. So you want to be sure you go far enough out there. In women, I, I talk about uh, the dumbbell-shaped design, which is something I came up with to understand the, the Christmas tree pattern with a little bit of extension in a small crown area that sometimes we neglect. So this is something that I typically uh, see in women. When you're talking about the crown, we also have a vocabulary that we can communicate. We heard earlier about hairlines, central forelocks, lateral humps, etc. And this is a terminology we use to articulate when we talk about the crown, which is a division into the center of the whorl, the upper arc, which is to me anything above that whorl, the lower arc is anything below the whorl, and then the vertex transition point or vertex transition zone is that, again, transition you heard from a vertical to horizontal scalp. Why are these landmarks important? Do they mean anything? Yes, you'll hear when we strategize how we strategize and how these sub-geographies make a difference. The other thing, too, is when you're looking at natural hair patterns, there is our natural soft transitions. In other words, when you start with the whorl, how do you get that whorl to match up with the extending area around it? Well, what you do is there are transition points that naturally blend. It's not this all of a sudden jagged transition. And so you see this little dotted line is where there's a little transition going into the lateral, the posterior uh, mid scalp and the la lateral hump and then the donor hair. So really think when you're making all types of, of, of recipient sites that there are no abrupt angle changes from here all of a sudden or there. It's a gradual flow across all these areas. And again, that's going to lie a little outside the topic of these presentations, but just as a point. What is a preferred design? If someone has an existing pattern, you don't want to create an abrupt pattern that doesn't match as other ones, otherwise all the hairs will be competing. But if there's very little hair left or it's pretty much bald and you can have aesthetic freedom to create the world that you would like, what would be a preferred design and why? I typically think that for someone that parts his hair, is a right-handed person parting his hair this way, it may behoove you to, to actually make a clockwise whorl that matches the hair part for multiple reasons. One is the fact that it won't compete against the direction of the hair part. And the second thing, it will actually arch upwards. Sorry, oh, I may hit it twice. Um, and it matches the hair part. So think about the hair part. Here's a hair part where there's openness, right? There's an actual visual gutter. And if you create where your whorl is going to arch up and hit that part zone, you're going to create visual density there. Again, something esoteric, advanced. I don't expect you to understand everything I'm telling you, but these are just ideas to understand what we go into when we get advanced and you get that creativity that really drives me to do good work. Um, and that's going to be something that I like to look at. So let's go back and look at these, these breakdowns. The numbers there are what I call density priorities. In other words, if I, if I have a certain number of graphs, I can just scatter it there. Do I just put some ones and twos and threes and, and put some over? No, I visually create visual density based on areas of highest priority because you have a limited number of graphs. So I'm talking about larger graphs per se, which we'll show in the next slide and where are the areas that my brain starts to visualize. When I sit there and strategize, I look at one being number one. Why is that so important? Because that's where it arches up, it covers the part, it covers on the upper arc, and maybe comes down a little bit. Two is second priority. Three covers a little bit less of the upper arc, but it helps me cover the lower arc. In other words, it cascades and covers over other areas that I'm transplanting, whereas five, six is really doing nothing. It's just covering over the donor hair where there's hair. I don't know if that makes sense, but these are, if it doesn't make sense, 
I, you know, you come and ask me afterwards, but it's just how I strategize, and you may not get all that. Four has me a little bit more of an upper arc, a little bit toward the lower arc, so I sort of put that in the middle. And these are just things that go through my head. I don't think it's in any other book or anything else, but, but what, I, what I've written. Um, these are graph sizes. You heard Amina talk a little bit about this. These may not be right for you. It obviously depends on the, how, you know, what caliber hairs you're dealing with. But I like to use two or three hairs in the central whorl um, so that I create some visual strength there. And if I've got it, they're not typically a lot of four hair graphs, but if I've got them, as, I, as you heard, the density priorities for me are going to be the upper arc. And then I take threes and, and twos accordingly. And you'll see actually a real life case where I, I've done this, um, but it's going to be actually a little different because there's a little artistry in each case. Uh, I use different types of instruments either needles or punches. This is just to show you a counterclockwise right-sided whirl. In other words, a whirl starting on the right side, the opposite of what I showed you in my preferred orientation because of how his hairs go. And this is a clockwise left-sided whirl. In other words, a whirl is starting on the left side and arcing, arching upwards. What are the angles? Remember angles we refer to the relative scalp position of the graph of the site itself. Remember in the front, go low. In the crown, it may be counterintuitive, but it should go high. Why should it go high? Multiple reasons. Number one, think about when these, these graphs sit in a whirl pattern. If they're very flush and flat, you're only going to put a certain number you can fit. When they're tilted up, they can compress into a closer packed zone. The, because they're all tight, more, tightly, more tightly packed and there's less space that's occupying from than, than when you're going uh, horizontally. The other reason is that, remember that lateral view where that you lose the arc, where the, the, it looks flatter? When you create a higher arc on the back side, you're going to have more lift. It's going to create more puff on the back side and it's create more visual density. The other way I like to look at it is I look at when a graph goes vertically up, it will fall back down on itself and create more of a visual pattern on the back side. So these are the opposite of what I like in a hairline. They're very high angles and they're very tightly packed together when possible. In the, in the art of hair restoration I referenced earlier, there should be very few abrupt transition angles. So what you're seeing here is from the angles, they go from low to relatively higher in the posterior mid scalp to relatively higher in the crown. So you don't want any transitions that are abrupt going to lower in the lower arc, going lower to the donor hair. So these are just ways that you can visualize not, no abrupt transitions in, in when you're becoming hopefully uh, more artistic. And again, the three reasons, rounder profile from the lateral view, greater density packing, and I can place them tighter. This is just a, another schematic to show you uh, visually what I'm talking about. And this is just a case study. This is a gentleman that has existing hair. It is, it's not strong, but it, there are some. So I've just drawn out the upper lower arc, the vertex transition zone, some of the, uh, the, the uh, clockwise whirl that he has starting from the right side. Um, you can see some sites that I've already started here. These are two and three hair graphs, mainly three hairs after I sent, start the central whorl. Why do I use the threes there? Because the threes are creating that cascade of overlap going out to the left. So I want to actually do the upper and lower arc, since there's a great distance going from the right side to the left to cover, I think both the upper and lower arcs take precedence in this particular circumstance. And so this is the artistry of just thinking a little bit more esoterically than just making a circle. And then I, um, well, let's see if I can show you some breakdowns here. Uh, this is just showing with the center of the world. Now I've created the upper portion. This is a breakdown of the, the pink area are the threes. The uh, orange are the two hair graphs. The uh, vertex transition zone where there, it's less exposed going over that area where I want to create visual density because if you think about how light strikes this, the crown, it strikes the crown where the light arcs over from the horizontal, I'm sorry, vertical to horizontal plane, right? You see a, a light strike. So I want to create visual density there in the vertex transition zone. So those are diaphragmatic unit graphs or stronger graphs up the, in that area. And then the areas of lesser priority around it transitioning to the posterior mid scalp and in the lower arc are two hair graphs placed a little bit more openly. And so that's really just a schematic of thinking about it. I always, now I use everything on EMR digitally, but when I was doing things on paper, I would always draw where, I play, where the twos, threes, 
DFUs should go for my staff so they would know the blueprint even though it's in front of them it's sometimes hard to read what's a two and three I'll sit there and show them these are my twos and threes and how I hear the angles that I've created so that they don't have a hard time trying to match my world so I I always like color coding and drawing and this is the fun thing even if you don't understand all the details I just presented to you understand that hair restoration is not just a mechanical exercise it's an artistic one and I really didn't understand that for the first few years in practice until you start to see when your brain the light switches on and you can see the artistry behind what you do your your passions are start to be driven better and you start to create works of art and I think that's what makes hair so much more fun um, this is just showing after the graphs have been placed uh, and then the other thing too is patient position remember what I told you that when you're positioning a patient when they're doing the hairline you want them supine so that you can make the low angles and then when you're doing the upper crown I like to stand behind the patient so that you can get the lift there and work around that way but then when you have them if it's a, if it's a, a clockwise whirl you want them to be actually rotated over to one side so your hand doesn't have to torque and turn around and then I like to position the patient for a counterclockwise whirl on the opposite side it makes things much easier for my hand to to go around and do that especially the lower arc um, when I'm doing planning for a patient I usually tell them let's do the front first let's do the crown a year later from now when the scar is relaxed and we see what's grown in the front maybe I'll put a few more graphs to fill in the areas and then sometimes you need to come back and touch up everything and the third time do you need the third time it's always better to inform them that they may so that you don't get in a situation that you you haven't they feel like they're inadequate with only two sessions and sometimes you need to tell them more here's a clockwise whirl the gentleman you saw is a schematic we used side view you can see that rounding effect and the flattening effect in the preoperative photograph that does affect a patient even from a side view this is a gentleman that's had like seven transplants in the other parts of his scalp and like six reductions and you see the slot deforming this is just one session to correct it and so not dense but at least it covers up a lot of the scar and some of the uh, unnaturalness of the back side this is a gentleman that's on Propecia so he's got a little bit more of an unusual shape to it and uh, this is a lady that has a diffuse pattern on the back side that you can see so women do have crown loss and this is a gentleman to show you how fine graphs even though you don't create tight visual density you at least covered enough that it doesn't look like a bald spot and then this is just what I love is when I have the upper arc because when you have the upper arc in isolation and all the graft angles go straight forward then you almost have a posterior mid scalp and you can almost create that visual density and that tightness that you couldn't when you're dealing with a whole big world I don't know that makes sense they're all facing one direction and that makes things easier to place but you can actually strike greater visual density with that so thank you for your attention